He used marijuana starting at the age of 14 and battled for the next five years his addiction and eventually became psychotic from using very high potency wax and he jumped off a six-story building. I guess it was the only way he knew how to end his pain. Today we're at the 2015 Cannabis Cup. We're here with all weed connoisseurs, vendors, weed fashion, hemp fashion, food, snacks, baked goods, edibles, and some of the coolest, chillest people in Colorado. <laughs> in the early 2000s, Colorado became kind of a test bed for medical and then later recreational marijuana. You know, at the time, I wasn't really concerned. I didn't have a strong opinion about it either way. I, I didn't know that marijuana had changed so drastically from when we were younger. When Johnny turned 18, he was able to very easily get a, a medical card, and then he was able to legally purchase, possess, and consume very high THC products. That led to a psychosis. You know, he ultimately died as a result of a psychosis brought on by high THC marijuana. And I believe that if he had never consumed marijuana, that he'd still be here today. I am Connie Boyd, and I live in Denver, Colorado. My son was diagnosed with schizophrenia, uh, specifically from cannabis. About four years ago. Kara was in a gifted program through elementary and middle school, and he was doing great. And then he was introduced to marijuana his sophomore year or the summer over his sophomore year, and um, he failed every class his sophomore year. The first person was an African exchange student, Levi Thumba, who was studying in, Wisconsin, in uh, Wyoming and came to Denver to use marijuana with his friends. He was 19. He ate a marijuana edible and had a psychotic episode, jumped off of the bal balcony and died. What can we get started for you? You're up, man. Another person ate an edible. It didn't do anything for him. Ate another one, ended up killing himself. You know, when, when you use these edibles, it's not like smoking. It doesn't affect you immediately. It maybe takes 15, 20 minutes. And so maybe you've eaten three of them. And then all of a sudden, you get the burst of the high. And for many people, it's too much to bear. Yeah, so you're in Canyon Cultivation, or Mile High Distributing's kitchen, and we're gonna go in and see what everybody's doing as far as packaging all of our candy and our compliant packaging. All right, thank you. So this is where we are putting all of our edibles into the child-proof reclosable containers. Better than Watch your head going into our production area. We make everything by hand. And about three and a half years ago, uh, we started playing with old fashioned candy recipes. I also have a fear about the marijuana edibles that once my kids get in school, then other kids might bring some to school and not even realize that they are a marijuana edible and then offer it to my kids or when they go to their friends' houses, if those parents have them around and my kids don't know. I worry about that. My name is uh, Ken Finn. I'm a pain management physician in Colorado Springs. I've been practicing here for nearly 27 years. Hey there. How are you? Nice seeing you. I'm currently the president of the American Board of Pain Medicine. So I've learned quite a bit uh, in this journey. I've been speaking publicly, nationally, and internationally on this issue for over a decade, because I think we are uh, really having a problem with expanded marijuana programs and the impact on the opioid epidemic, because it's not helping. And I think that this has become simply another addiction for profit industry uh, off the backs of, of, of youth, because uh, they want lifelong customers. So this is really a public health and safety concern from my perspective. Show Johnny's room. Okay, it's up here.
We had this blanket made out of his favorite t-shirts. I was very addicted. He just couldn't stop. He tried, tried so hard. One time he stopped for four months and he was back to himself, happy, and ready to try again to go to school. And he went right back to the, to the dabs, bad crowd. And then the psychosis started. He couldn't stop. He was so addicted to the marijuana and he knew it hurt him. He knew, and he just couldn't stop. My name is Gregory B. I'm a recovering addict. I'm a member of Narcotics Anonymous. But I do have people in, in treatment for just marijuana. Oh, just yeah, marijuana. People can't stop. They can't stop, man. It's all day long. It's an addiction. They actually have mood disorders, have developed mood disorders. A lot of tickling and, and you know what I mean? Let's just say a million people smoke marijuana now, and 5% of them are marijuana addicts. If they legalize marijuana, and 2 million people smoke marijuana now, will there be more than five? There will be, be more. 20, it'll be 20% because a percentage of the people who were smoking before really couldn't get it as easily as it can now. I have worked for over 20 years now in this community as a substance abuse counselor, and I have worked with people, you know, all the way, all the way to a very extreme, uh, like extreme situations with addiction, substance use, really hard drug use. And that was still at the time when people thought marijuana is not addictive. And I have worked with people who could quit methamphetamine use, heroin use, crack cocaine, and they could not quit marijuana. I would say at least 80% have at least tried marijuana. I would say it's a very small fraction of people who have never smoked weed and never want to. Right now, living in Boulder, kids want to smoke. Kids want to get high because it's normalized. Everybody does it, so why can't I? And I feel like that mentality is what's so scary. And that's what's leading people to these awful addictions that they don't even realize are addictions. I mean, I can tell you I was one of those people that I would sob and cry and scream and yell and slam doors and break things when I wouldn't get my weed. I used to, I had my ex-boyfriend for a while buy me weed because he was overage. Um, and there would be days where he'd be like, hey, I couldn't afford the dabs that you wanted. They were too expensive. And I would just break down in his house, sobbing, freaking out. I didn't have dabs. And so it felt like my life was over. And frankly, there were times where I was suicidal because I couldn't get my hands on what made me happy. I would say that it started out with like, oh, it's just weed. And then it was, oh, it's just shrooms. And then it was, oh, it's just coke oh, and then it was oh it's just pills and, and it's oh i'm just gonna do it once yeah and then it's oh i'm just gonna try this once and then never do it again and Oops. then it's like oh i only use it once a day oh i only use it twice a day and everything just seems more and more reasonable the more that you do it exactly and you surround yourself with people who are encouraging you to do it and not to stop and everything just gets really bad really fast that's and i'm worried that's gonna happen to more people and it's interesting because there's such a link, and this is kind of where my wheelhouse comes in. There's a very strong link between cannabinoids and opioids. The number one risk factor for adolescent opioid misuse is ever having used marijuana, lifetime use of marijuana. Um, the, the number one predictor of opioid use disorder in an adult is ever having used marijuana before the age of 18. So the link between Cannabis and opioids is very strong. The National Survey of Drug Use and Health. Heroin users don't start with heroin. They usually start with booze and pot. It's a gateway drug. And people will argue with me, uh, but I cannot see the data that proves me wrong. Uh, most of the data shows that there is a relationship between progression of what was considered a benign substance like alcohol or marijuana to harder drugs. So here's a graphic. This is from the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment. Uh, data and the graphic on drug overdoses over time. 
So you can see that since legalization, the prescription opioid deaths have gone up, methamphetamine has gone up, cocaine has gone up, and, and um, uh, fentanyl has gone up. And then this is the provisional 2020 data. Look what happened to the prescription opioids. They went through the roof. Fentanyl has gone through the roof. Just in one year, fentanyl overdoses went up over 115% in Colorado. Um, cocaine is going up. Methamphetamine is going up. And if you can look at the data compared to 2014, when we legalize all of these substances, people who are dying in Colorado have gone up over 100%. Fentanyl, 700% in particular. So I work in the emergency department. This is the third busiest emergency department in the state of Colorado. And we see, at least every day, we see marijuana cases. So if I work every single day I work, I see at least one or two problems that are medical problems directly related from cannabis. We see it every single day. And most of the time, these people do not come on their own. They're usually either in an ambulance or police are bringing them here. Sometimes family members get them here. I've done emergency medicine for over 25 years, and this sometimes is the most acute presentation of psychosis, where people are screaming, yelling, they have no idea where they're at, and they're very combative and very agitated. People tend to be completely out of it. They need a lot of medications to sedate them, and they need a prolonged observation in the emergency department. We're seeing more and more of these cases. And sadly, the youngest person that I saw was 12, who came with acute psychosis. So. We're seeing a lot of it in younger kids. The number of people using marijuana almost every day has increased by a factor of seven in the United States since 1992. And the number of people using marijuana almost every day has increased 57% since 2007. So this isn't about the guy wanting to smoke a joint and an adult wanting to use some pot now and then. Not at all. This is about heavy use, young people using almost every day. This is the crux of the problem. And legalization makes it worse because legalization is commercialization. It's mass promotion. Yeah, so what do you want? Well, we're in Denver right now, which is the capital of our state, Colorado, uh, at the 420 rally. And uh, it's basically where everybody comes together and smokes cannabis. Our state is very about cannabis. <laughs> um, you know, and you can't get out of it. And it started with something so innocent as wanting to socialize. Like when I first started using marijuana, it was because I wanted to connect with my friends, which is a beautiful thing. Um, and in Natural Highs, we teach how to connect with people without having to use substances. But, you know, it wasn't until I was 20 years old that I was taught, hey, you actually don't need substances to connect with people giving people education around it because we're taught in high school and in middle school, hey, drugs are bad, marijuana's bad, don't do it, it's a gateway drug. But you kind of laugh. Like, I remember laughing in middle school, being like, who the hell are these people? You know, and then when I started to go on my own journey, I was like, wow, yes, marijuana is a gateway drug. And really realizing how powerful and how, how much it took over me. Um, so yeah, education is key and not normalizing it anymore because there's nothing normal about it. You know, your brain is developing up until about 25 or, or 30 even. And what that means is your brain is essentially under construction. Anything that affects that brain uh, has the ability to affect it for the rest of its life, much more than when you're an adult. It's why if you're a child and you learn a second language, you actually learn it easier than if you're an adult. Your brain is a sponge. It's taking everything in. The flip side of that, is the issue of addiction. And so any drug that comes into contact, you know, that you come into contact with and it affects your brain, is one that has the ability to stay with you for a very long time. And for marijuana, it's certainly the case because it affects the parts of the brain that are responsible for all kinds of things, including learning, concentration, uh, coordination. I think something that's really important about uh, talking about marijuana is how it destabilizes your um, able to ability to uh, regulate your emotions. It's really interesting. The endocannabinoid system actually, uh, the more you use marijuana, the more that you can't regulate. Like, yeah, you can't regulate your emotions. The problem is we have such a high suicide rate and such high rates of depression amongst teens um, and young adults, and I think that kind of gets left out of these conversations about drug use sometimes. 
is that it's a way to dull the pain, but it also starts this vicious cycle where you're using weed to dull this pain that you have. And it also creates this instability in your system. Um, and then it just keeps going and going and going. And um, I've seen a lot of people fall down that route and um, I almost did myself. And it's really challenging to come out of it, especially here. You know what, if you want, I can just check your IDs. Let's just come on in and I'll have you right on inside, okay? And the presence of marijuana in all age groups that complete suicide has risen every single year since legalization. We have an increase in marijuana-related driving fatalities. Uh, we have increased utilization of an already stressed healthcare system. Uh, the latest data that I read that for every dollar generated in Colorado, it costs 450 to regulate. I'm not sure that 450 is what I think is the right number. I think it's less than that, but it's certainly not a money maker. It's just like any other substance of addiction. It's a money loser. Um, and it's, the societal costs are going to far outstrip any type of money that's put in the pockets of the states. When you talk about finances for cannabis and the communities are promised all kinds of tax revenue, but what they don't understand and what they don't see in the background, and this is what I try to share with the politicians, is that you're not seeing the costs that are associated with it to the community. And the costs are super high when you talk about the number of emergency room visits so if we take just one problem that we see with cannabis, and that's hyperemesis related to cannabinoid use um, or CHS, these people are young, typically in their 20s, 30s, and they'll present with repetitive recyclic vomiting that is often profound and pretty severe. And we actually, the sound they make while they're vomiting, we term scrometing. It's a combination of scream and vomiting. And so if this person comes to the emergency room, and these people will come frequently, they get CT scans, they get blood work, IVs, medications, nursing time, not counting imaging, scanning, or hospitalization. If we just say the cost for an ED visit, medications, nursing, that kind of stuff, is about $5,000 to $6,000 a day, or a visit. So if we say in our emergency department, I would hazard that we're saying at least one a day, if not more. So if we say one visit once a day for hyperemesis at the cost of about $5,000, the total cost, um, and that's our ER cost, is about $1.8 million. And that's just one visit, one day, one ER, and there's 25 ERs in Colorado. You know, one of the big hopes with legalization was that the black market would disappear. And that's still the big promise of the cannabis industry, that they would help the black market to disappear. But what we're seeing is that because an 18-year-old high school student can get a Met card easily uh, and can, then can buy as much cannabis uh, high THC products as they want, uh, we see a huge black market. Uh, from kids to kids. And unfortunately, you know, because any drug use is illegal for kids, including marijuana, including alcohol, any young person that is involved in drug use, in my experience, is often also involved in the distribution, which of course puts kids at high risk for legal involvement and things like that. So we see that that, that is, has created a huge black market. Can you tell please how easy it is to get, to get marijuana and oh, right. like... I could, well, I could probably have someone deliver it right here, <laughs> right now. <laughs> like, that's how easy it is. It, it's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. There are actually a lot of um, plugs in the Colorado area, and everyone's, uh, I don't know, a lot of people just want to make their money, and they're selling weed and marijuana in order to do that. And that's why it's so easy nowadays, because it's such a simple way to make money, and it's a ridiculous way to make a lot of profit. All right, so it's interesting in a neighborhood like this, when you have a grow house um, and the plants and flower, you can smell as you're riding your bike or your horse by the house, you can smell. And this house was a known Cuban cartel grow house twice that we know of at least, and it is uh, a group that was known to be heavily armed. Um, it's been bought by a reseller and fixed up but it still has that memory of this. As your neighbor smelled like pot continuously, it was really run down. The whole living room, the top floor there where the windows are were nothing but big air conditioning units. And this house, the, the cartel or the people who were running it 
dug under this driveway and live tapped into the junction box there so they were stealing energy. And they also did the same thing in the back with the water, so they were stealing water. The other thing, a lot of times what will happen is you'll have these grow houses in neighborhoods like this, and um, they're being run by people who are being human trafficked. So they'll take a family here to tend the plants, tend the crops, and it is, looks gives the appearance of a family living here. And it's a lot of times people being trafficked. The black market's not gone. The black market is alive and well. And there's no, I mean, you can have home grows, but there's no plant police. No one comes around and checks how many plants you have unless it becomes an issue. So we see that. And where you're going to have your illegal grows, right here in these neighborhoods. And so when the industry said, yep, we're going to make these and all this illegal or black market stuff will go away, the black market stuff is alive and well here in Colorado. And it may be your neighbor like it was mine. So I think one of the things that a lot of people don't know about marijuana is that the way it works is that THC is a copy of a neurotransmitter we all have naturally in the brain. It's called anandamide. And it's actually one of our main calming neurotransmitters. So it helps us deal with stress and helps us calm down. So like kind of like a natural chill out neurotransmitter. Now, the reason most people don't know about it is because the cannabis industry is not using the term anandamide. They are using the term endocannabinoids really to create the impression that we have the copy of the cannabis plant, right? And so then the rationale is, oh, you have cannabinoid receptors. So obviously you have receptors for cannabinoids. So you should probably use cannabis. Uh, it's a big misconception because it's not that we have a copy of cannabis. It's that cannabis is a copy of a neurotransmitter that we all have. But of course, because we all have it, you cannot make money off of it, right? And so that's why nobody is teaching people about it. Nobody's teaching people, hey, you have the natural neurotransmitter inside of you. You don't need to buy the copy. You know, learn about the natural neurotransmitter and how to make more of it, how to release it, and how to feel good on your own supply. The body releases these chemicals, right? And then what happens next? What happens next to these chemicals? What? Electricity. Well, it starts out with electricity. It goes then into the horseshoes. It goes into the receptors. That's right. And, and then they eat it. And that causes another electrical impulse. And that is what you feel as a chill out feeling, right? Okay, watch it. Watch it. You put your back to the other person and then you start pushing and you try to be the winner, okay? You try to push the other person. Push as hard as you can. Push harder, push harder, come on, come on. Push as hard as you can. Push as hard, oh my gosh. Push as hard as you can, okay? Push harder, push harder. Okay, and then, then take a moment, sit down. Sit down, sit down, and close your eyes and feel the anandamide kicking in, okay? Check your body and feel your chill out neurotransmitter kicking in. That is the function of anandamide, that after you exhaust yourself, after you exert yourself physically, you feel the chill out neurotransmitter kicking in. Can you feel that? And now check for a second. Can you feel the similarity to THC? Can you feel it that this is actually what people are looking for, right? I think people should remember that this is about money. It's about getting rich. It's about starting the next tobacco industry. It's about starting a special interest lobbying group. You know, when I was working in Washington, DC, there were 15 lobbyists for every member of Congress from the alcohol and tobacco industries. So you can imagine with marijuana what that's going to look like. This is about a small number of people getting very rich. And I think, frankly, the rest of the world is looking at America and, you know, saying, oh, you want to try and legalize marijuana and make your population less smart and less competitive? Go for it, <laughs> because it's going to help other countries. Since legalization, the industry has created products that were not available before. 
You know, so THC potency before legalization was under 10%. And now we don't know what a product does in a teenage brain or even in an, in an adult brain that has 60, 70, 80, 90 percent THC. We have absolutely no research on that. So in the Netherlands, for example, anything that has above 15 percent THC is considered a hard drug and is getting prosecuted like a hard drug. It is not the same marijuana <laughs> when I was a kid a very low percentage of THC. Now it's over 90% with the shatters and waxes and dabs that they're using. It's very toxic. It's very dangerous. We founded Johnny's Ambassadors six months after he died. We have 2,200 ambassadors so far. We are hoping to start a, a large movement of ambassadors all over the U.S. and the world to really raise awareness and to speak our truth about the harms to our youth from these new products and to yell loudly and to demand change and to get guardrails put in place for our youth and legislation that protects them until their brains are formed. And we have to call on fellow citizens and voters to put the changes in place that prevents this because we will lose many generations of young children with mental issues, psychosis, bipolar, delusion, paranoia. There are so many illnesses that result from this and they will never be the same. And it could happen to anyone, any child. And we don't want any parents to have to put up with the hell that we are going through. We don't want anyone to follow Johnny's path.